So I I don't want to embarrass Rachel, but I'm very excited that Rachel's here. So this is Rachel, for those of you that don't know. Um, she's not quite back on her feet after her illness, but well enough to at least come to at least part of this lesson. So don't worry if she can't stay for the whole thing. And I'm really glad she's here because Rachel actually wrote the vast majority of the lesson we're going to see. It's I think it's a really, really cool work. Um, so I'm glad she's going to at least see it being taught, even if unfortunately she's not teaching it herself. Um, so, so coming. Uh, good Thanksgiving present, best Thanksgiving present. Um, so we're, uh, as we discussed at the end of last lesson, we're kind of moving from the decision tree ensembles to, um, to neural nets, broadly defined. And um, as we discussed, you know, random forests and decision trees uh, are limited by the fact, in the end, that they're basically um, they're basically doing nearest neighbors, right? You know, that all they can do is to get return the average of a bunch of other points. And so they can't extrapolate out to, you know, if you're thinking, what happens if I increase my prices by 20% um, and you've never priced at that level before, or what's going to happen to sales next year, and obviously we've never seen next year before, um, it's very hard to extrapolate. It's also hard if it needs to, uh, you know, like it's, it can only do around log base 2 n decisions, you know, and so if there's like a time series it needs to fit to that takes like four steps to kind of get to the right time area, then suddenly there's not many decisions left for it to make. So there's kind of this limited amount of computation that it can do. Uh, so there's a limited complexity of relationship that it can model. Right? Um, yes, Prince. Uh, can I ask about one more drawback of random forest that yeah. uh, I feel? So if we have a data as categorical variable which are not in sequential order, so for random forest, we encode them and treat them as numbers, let's say we have 10, uh, 20 cardinality and 1 to 20. So the result that random forest gives is like, uh, the split that random forest gives is something like less than 5, less than 6. But if the categories are not sequential, not in any order, what does that mean? Yeah, so, um, so if you've got like, uh, Oh, let's go back to bulldozers. Erops, uh, Erops with a C, Orops, and a, I don't know, whatever, right? And we arbitrarily label them like this, right? Um, and so actually we know that all that really mattered was if it had air conditioning. So what's going to happen? Well, it's basically going to say like, okay, if I group it into those together and those together, that like, that's an interesting break, just because it so happens that the air conditioning ones all are going to end up in the right hand side. And then having done that, right, it's then going to say, okay, well within the group with the two and three, it's going to notice that it's furthermore going to have to split it into two more groups. So eventually it's going to get there, it's going to pull out that category, it's just, it's going to take more splits than we would ideally like. Um, so it's kind of similar to the fact that for it to model a line, it can only do it with lots of splits and only approximately. So random forest is fine with categories that are not sequential also? Yeah, so it can do it, it's just like in some way it's suboptimal because we just need to do more breakpoints than we would have liked, but it, it gets there. It does a pretty good job, and so even although random forests, you know, do have some deficiencies, um, they're incredibly powerful. Um, you know, particularly because they have so few assumptions, they're really hard to screw up. And you know, it's kind of hard to actually win a Kaggle competition with a random forest, um, but it's very easy to get like top ten percent. So in like in real life, where often that third decimal place doesn't matter. Random forests are often like what you end up doing. Um, but for some things like this Ecuadorian groceries competition, it's very, very hard to get a good result with a random forest. Um, because like there's a huge time series component, and like nearly everything is these two massively high cardinality categorical variables, which is the store and the item, 
and like so there's so there's very little there to even throw at a random forest and the you know the difference between every pair of stores is kind of different in different ways and so you know there are some things uh, that are just hard to get even relatively good results with a random forest another example is recognizing numbers um, you can get like okay results with a random forest but in the end the kind of the relationship between you know like the, the spatial structure turns out to be important right and you kind of want to be able to do like computations like finding edges or whatever that kind of carry forward through through the computations so you know just doing a, a kind of a, a clever nearest neighbors like a random forest you know turns out not to be ideal um, so for stuff like this neural networks turn out that they are ideal uh, neural networks turn out to be something that, that works particularly well for both things like the Ecuadorian groceries competition so forecasting sales over time by store and by item uh, and for things like um, recognizing digits and for things like turning voice into speech and so it's kind of nice between these two things neural nets and random forests we kind of cover the territory right uh, I don't I haven't needed to use anything other than these two things uh, for a very long time um, and we'll actually learn uh, I don't know in what course exactly, but at some point we'll learn also how to combine the two because you can combine the two in really cool ways So um, here's a picture from uh, Adam uh, Geitke uh, of um, an image so an image is just a bunch of numbers right and um, each of those numbers is 0 to 255 and the dark ones are too close to 255 the light ones are close to zero All right uh, so here is um, an example of a digit uh, from this uh, MNIST data set. MNIST is a really old, it's like a hello world of, of, machine, of neural networks. Um, and so here's an example. And so there are 28 by 28 pixels. If it was uh, color, there would be three of these, one for red, one for green, one for blue. Okay. Um, so our job is to look at you know, the array of numbers and figure out that this is the number eight, which is tricky. Right? How do we do that? Um, so we're going to use a few, a small number of fast AI pieces, and we're gradually going to remove more and more and more until by the end we'll have implemented our own neural network from scratch, our own training loop from scratch, and our own matrix multiplication from scratch. Um, so we're gradually going to dig in further and further. Um, all right. So the data for um, MNIST. Um, which is the name of this very famous data set um, uh, is available from here and uh, we have a thing in fastai.io uh, called get data which will grab it from a URL and store it from your on your computer unless it's already there in which case it'll just go ahead and use it okay and um, then we've got a little function here called load MNIST which simply um, loads it up uh, you'll see um, that it's uh, zipped so we can just use Python's gzip to open it up and then it's also pickled. So if you have any kind of Python object at all, uh, you can use this uh, built-in Python library called pickle uh, to uh, dump it out uh, onto your disk, um, share it around, load it up later, and you get back the same Python object you started with. So you've already seen this, something like this, with like um, uh, pandas feather format. Right? Uh, pickle is not just for pandas, it's not just for anything, it works for basically nearly every Python object. So, um, which might lead to the question, well, why didn't we use pickle for a pandas data frame? Right? And the answer is, pickle works for nearly every Python object, but it's probably not like optimal for nearly any Python object. Right? So because like we were looking at pandas data frames with like over 100 million rows, we really want to save that quickly, and so Feather is a format that's specifically designed for that purpose, and so it's going to do that really fast. If we tried to pickle it, it would have been taken a lot longer. Right? Also note that pickle files uh, are only for Python, so you can't give them to somebody else, whereas like a Feather file you can hand around. Okay. So it's worth knowing that pickle exists, because if you've got some dictionary or some kind of object floating around that you want to 
save for later or send to somebody else, you can always just pickle it. Okay. Uh, so in this particular case, the folks at deeplearning.net were kind enough to provide a pickled version. Um, pickle has changed slightly uh, over time, um, and so uh, old pickle files like this one, you actually have to. This was a Python 2 one, so you have to tell it that it was encoded using this particular Python 2 character set. Um, but other than that, Python 2 and 3 can normally open each other's pickle files. All right. So once we've loaded that in, um, we load it in like so. And so this thing which we're doing here, this is called destructuring. And so destructuring means that load MNIST is giving us back a tuple of tuples. And so if we have on the left hand side of the equal sign a tuple of tuples, we can fill all these things in. So we're given back a, a tuple of training data, a tuple of validation data, and a tuple of test data. Uh, in this case, I don't care about the test data, so I just put it into a variable called underscore, which um, kind of by like uh, people in Python people tend to think of underscore as being a special variable which we put things we're going to throw away into. It's actually not special, um, but it's just it's really common. If you see something assigned to underscore, it probably means you're just throwing it away, right? Um, by the way, in a Jupyter notebook, it does have a special meaning, which is the last cell. That you calculate is always available in underscore, by the way. But that's kind of a separate issue. Um, so then the first thing in that tuple is itself a tuple, and so we're going to stick that into x and y for our training data, and then the second one goes into x and y for our validation data. Okay, so that's called destructuring, uh, and it's pretty common in lots of languages. Um, some languages don't support it, um, but those that do, life becomes a lot easier. So as soon as I you know look at some new data set, I just check out what's what have I got, right? So what's its type? Okay, it's a NumPy array. Uh, what's its shape? It's fifty thousand by seven eight four. And then what about the dependent variables? That's an array. Its shape is fifty thousand. So this image is not of length seven eight four. It's of size twenty eight by twenty eight. So what happened here? Well, we could guess, and we can check on the website, it turns out we would be right, that all they did was they took the second row and concatenated it to the first row, and the third row and concatenated it to that, and the fourth row and concatenated it to that. So in other words, they took this whole 28 by 28 and flattened it out into a single 1D array. Does that make sense? So it's going to be of size 28 squared. Um, this is not like normal. By any means, uh, so don't think like everything you see is going to be like this. Most of the time, when people share images, they share them as JPEGs or PNGs. You load them up, you get back a nice 2D array. Um, but in this particular case, for whatever reason, the thing that they pickled uh, was flattened out to be 784. Okay, and this word "flatten" uh, is very common with uh, you know kind of working with tensors. So when you flatten a tensor. It just means that you're turning it into a uh, a lower rank tensor than you started with. In this case, we started with a rank two tensor, a matrix, uh, for each image, and we turned each one into a rank one tensor, i.e., a vector. So overall, the whole thing, you know, is a rank two matrix, uh, a rank two tensor rather than a rank three tensor. So just to remind us of, you know, the jargon here. Um, this, in math, we would call a vector. Right? In computer science, we would call it a 1D array. Um, but because deep learning have people have to um, come across as smarter than everybody else, we have to call this a rank 1 tensor. Okay. They all mean the same thing, more or less. Unless you're a physicist, in which case this means something else, and you get very angry at the deep learning people because you say it's not a tensor. Um, so there you go. Don't blame me. This is just what people say. So this is either a matrix or a 2D array or a rank 2 tensor. And so once we start to get into three dimensions, we start to run out of mathematical names 
right? Which is why we start to be nice just to say rank 3 tensor. And so there's actually nothing special about vectors and matrices that make them in any way more important than rank 3 tensors or rank 4 tensors or whatever. So I try not to use the terms vector and matrix where possible, um, because I don't really think they're they're any more special than any other rank of tensor. Okay, so kind of it's good to get used to thinking of this as a rank 2 tensor. Okay, and then um, the the rows and columns. Um, if it was a if we're computer science people, we would call this dimension zero and dimension one. Um, but if we're deep learning people, we would call this axis zero or axis one. Okay, and then just to be really confusing, if you're an image person, this is the first axis and this is the second axis, right? So if you think about like TVs, you know, 1920 by 1080, columns by rows. Everybody else, including deep learning and mathematicians, rows by columns. So this is pretty confusing if you use like the Python imaging library, you get back columns by rows, pretty much everything else, rows by columns. So be careful. Because they, they hate us. Because <laughs> they're bad people. <laughs> I guess. Um, I mean, there's a lot of just... Um, Particularly in deep learning, like a whole lot of different areas have come together, like information theory, computer vision, statistics, signal processing, and to, you've ended up with this hodgepodge of nomenclature in deep learning. Often, like every version of things will be used. So today we're going to hear about something that's called either negative log likelihood or binomial or categorical cross entropy, depending on where you come from. We've already seen something that's called either one-hot encoding or dummy variables, depending on where you come from. And really it's just like the same concept gets kind of somewhat independently invented in different fields, and eventually they find their way to machine learning, and then we don't know what to call them, so we call them all of the above. Something like that. Um, so I think that's what's happened with, with computer vision rows and columns. So. Um, there's this idea of normalizing data, which is subtracting out the mean and dividing by the standard deviation. Um, so a question for you. Um, do you th like often it's important to normalize the data so that we can more easily train a model. Um, do you think it would be important to normalize the independent variables um, for a random forest if we're training a random forest? I'm going to be honest, I don't know why we don't need to normalize, I just know that we don't. We don't. Okay. Does anybody want to think about why? Kara? It wouldn't matter because uh, each scaling and uh, transformation we, we can have will be applied to each row, and we will, we will be computing means as we were doing, like local averages, and at the end we will of course want to denormalize it back. To give, so it wouldn't change the result. I'm talking about the independent variables, not the dependent variable. Uh, I thought you asked about dependent okay. variables. Okay, who wants to have a go? Matthew. Uh, it might be because we just care about the relationship between the independent variables mm -hmm. and the dependent variable, so scale doesn't really matter. Okay, go on. How, um, why, why? Why? Why do we only like? Because at each split point, um, we can just divide to see uh, which, regardless of what scale you're on, uh, what minimizes variance, and that would that would. Right. So really, the key is that when we're deciding where to split, all that matters is the order. Like, and all that matters is how they're sorted. So if we divide by the uh, subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation, they're still sorted in the same order. So remember when we implemented the random forest, we said sort them, and then we like it, then we completely ignored the values. We just said like now add on one thing from the dependent at a time. So so random forests only care about the sort order of the independent variables. They don't care at all about their size. 
And so that's why they're wonderfully immune to outliers, because they totally ignore the fact that it's an outlier. They only care about which one's higher than what other thing, right? So this is an important concept. It doesn't just appear in random forests. It occurs in some metrics as well. For example, area under the ROC curve you come across a lot. That right? area under the ROC curve completely ignores scale and only cares about sort. Um, we saw something else when we did the dendrogram. Uh, Spearman's correlation is a rank correlation, only cares about order, not about scale. So random forests, one of the many wonderful things about them are that we can completely ignore uh, a lot of these statistical distribution issues. But we can't for deep learning, because for deep learning we're trying to train a parameterized model. Uh, so we do need to normalize our data. Um, if we don't, then it's going to be much harder to create a network that trains effectively. So we grab the mean and the standard deviation of our training data, and subtract out the mean, divide by the standard deviation, and that gives us a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Now for our validation data, we need to use the standard deviation and mean from the training data. Right? We have to normalize it the same way. Just like categorical variables, we had to make sure they had the same indexes mapped to the same levels for a random forest, or um, missing values, we had to make sure we had the same median used when we were replacing the missing values. You need to make sure anything you do in the training set, you do exactly the same thing in the test and validation set. So here I'm subtracting out the training set mean, the training set standard deviation, so this is not exactly zero, and this is not exactly one, but it's pretty close. And so in general, if you find you try something on a validation set or a test set and it's like much, much, much worse than your training set, it's probably because you um, normalized in an inconsistent way or encoded categories in an inconsistent way or something like that. All right, so let's take a look at some of this data. Uh, so we've got uh, 10,000 images in the validation set. And each one is a rank 1 tensor of length 784. Uh, in order to display it, I want to turn it into a rank 2 tensor of 28 by 28. Uh, so there's a uh, NumPy has a reshape function uh, that takes um, a tensor in and reshapes it to whatever size tensor you request. Now if you think about it, you only need to tell it about if there are d axes, you only need to tell it about d minus one of the axes you want, because the last one it can figure out for itself, right? So in total, there are ten thousand by seven hundred and eighty-four numbers here altogether, right? So you, if you say, well, I want my last axes to be twenty-eight by twenty-eight, then you can figure out that this must be ten thousand, otherwise it's not going to fit. Does that make sense? So if you put minus one. It says like make it as big or as small as you have to to make it fit, and so you can see here it figured out it has to be ten thousand. So you'll see this used in uh, neural net uh, software uh, preprocessing and stuff like that all the time. Like I could have written ten thousand here, but I try to get into a habit of like any time I'm referring to like how many items are in my input, I I tend to use minus one because like it just means later on I could like. Use a subsample. This code wouldn't break. I could, you know, do some kind of stratified sampling. If it was unbalanced, this code wouldn't break. So by using this kind of approach of saying like minus one here for the size, it just makes it more resilient to changes later. It's a good habit to get into. So this kind of idea of like being able to take tensors and reshape them and 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 change axes around and stuff like that is something you need to be like totally do without thinking, um, because it's going to happen all the time. So for example, here's one. I tried to read in some images, they were flattened, I need to unflatten them into a bunch of matrices. Okay, reshape, bang. Um, I, read some, I read some images in with OpenCV, and it turns out OpenCV uh, orders the channels um, blue, green, red. Everything else expects them to be red, green, blue. I need to reverse the last axis. How do you do that? Um, I read in some images with um, Python imaging library. It reads them as um, you know rows by columns by channels. PyTorch expects channels by rows by columns. How do I 
transform that. So these are all things you need to be able to do without thinking, like straight away, because they just it happens all the time, and you never want to be sitting there thinking about it for ages. So make sure you spend a lot of time over the week just practicing with things like all the stuff we're going to see today, reshaping, slicing, reordering dimensions, um, stuff like that. And so the best way is to create some small tenses yourself and start thinking like, okay, what shall I experiment with? So here, um, can we pass that over there? Do you mind if I backtrack a little bit? Of course, I love it. So back in Normalize, you say, like, you might have gone over this, but I'm still like wrestling with it a little bit. Yeah. You say many machine learning algorithms behave better when the data is normalized, yeah. but you also just said that scale doesn't really matter. So like, I, I said it doesn't matter for random forests. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so random like, forests are just going to split things based on order. And so we love them. We love random forests for the way they're so immune to worrying about distributional assumptions. But we're not doing random forests. We're doing deep learning, and deep learning does care. Can we generalize this? Uh, Can you pass it over there? If we have a parametric, then we should scale. If we have a non-parametric, then we should not have to scale. Can we generalize? No, not or? quite, right? Because like um, k nearest neighbors is non-parametric, and scale matters a hell of a lot. Yeah. So I would say things involving trees generally are just going to split at a point, and so probably you don't care about scale. Um, but you know, you you probably just need to think like, is this an algorithm that uses order, or does it use specific numbers? Can can you please give us an intuition of why it needs scale? Just because that's, that would may clarify um, some of the issues. Um, not until we get to doing SGD. So we're going to get to that. Yeah. So for now, we're just going to say, take my word for it. Now, can you pass it to Daniel? So this is probably a dumb question, but can you like explain a little bit more what you mean by scale? Because I guess when I think of scale, I'm like, oh, all the numbers should be generally the same size. Um, that's exactly like, what we mean. But is that like the case like with the cats and dogs that we went over with like the deep learning like you could have a small cat and like a larger cat but it would still know that those were both cats oh i guess you know this is one of these problems where language gets overloaded yeah so in computer vision when we scale an image we're actually increasing the size of the cat uh, in this case we're scaling the actual pixel values um, so in both case scaling means to make something bigger and smaller in this case We're taking the numbers from 0 to 255 and making them so that they have an average of zero and a standard deviation of one Jeremy um, Could you please explain us is it by column by row? by pixel by pixel when, so, when, when so you there's have, a single in general when yeah. you're scaling um, in my, just not thinking about a, a picture, but a kind of an input yeah. to a machine learning. So okay, method. yeah, sure. So I mean, it's it's a little bit subtle, but in this case, I've just got a single mean and a single standard deviation, right? So it's basically, on average, um, how how much black is there, right? And so on average, you know, we have a, a, a mean and a standard deviation across all the pixels. Um, in computer vision, we would normally do it by channel. So we would normally have one number for red, one number for green, one number for blue. Um, in general, you you need a different set of normalization coefficients for each like each thing you would expect to behave differently. So if we were doing like a structured data set where we've got like income, distance in kilometers, and number of children. Like you need three separate normalization coefficients for those. They're like very different kinds of things. Um, so yeah, it's kind of like a a bit domain specific here. It's like in this case, all of the pixels are, you know, levels of gray. So we've just got a single scaling number. Um, where else you could imagine if they were red versus green versus blue, you could need to scale those channels in different ways. Uh, can you pass that back, please. So I'm having a bit of trouble uh, imagining what would happen if we don't normalize in this case. Um, so so we, 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 we'll get there. So okay. for ne so we so this is kind of what Yannette was saying. It's like why do we normalize? And for now we're normalizing because I say we have to. Um, when we get to looking at stochastic gradient descent, we'll basically discover that if you um, basically to skip ahead a little bit, we're going to be doing a matrix multiply by a bunch of weights. We're going to 
pick those weights in such a way that when we do the matrix multiply, we're going to try to keep the numbers at the same scale that they started out as, and um, that's going to basically require the initial numbers. We're going to have to know what their scale is. So basically, it's much easier to create a single kind of neural network architecture that works for lots of different kinds of inputs if we know that they're consistently going to be mean zero, standard deviation one. Um, that would be the short answer. Um, but we'll learn a lot more about it. And if in a couple of lessons you're still not quite sure why, um, let's come back to it, because it's a really interesting thing to talk about. Um, yes, I, I, I'm just trying to visualize the axes we're working with here. So under plots, when you when you write so x valid shape, we get 10,000 by 7, 8, 4. Does yeah. that mean that we brought in 10,000 pictures yeah. of that dimension? Exactly. Okay. And then in the next line, um, when you choose to reshape it, is yeah. there a reason why you put 2828 on as um, uh, Y or Z coordinates, or is, is there a reason why they're in that order? Yeah, there is. Um, pretty much all neural network libraries assume that the first axis is like it's kind of the equivalent of a row. It's like a separate thing. It's a sentence or an image or a you know example of sales or whatever. So I want each image you know, to be a, a separate item of the first axis, uh, and then so that leaves two more axes for the rows and columns of the images. And that's pretty standard. That's totally standard. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen a library that doesn't work that way. Uh, can you pass it to our bureau? Uh, so while normalizing the validation data, I saw you have um, used mean of x and standard deviation of x data, training data only. Yes. So shouldn't we use mean and standard deviation of validation data? You mean like join them together or? No, separately calculating mean and No, mean. because you see, then you would be normalizing the validation set using different numbers. And so now the meaning of like this, this pixel has a value of three in the validation set has a different meaning to the meaning of three in the, in the training set. It would be like, um, if we had like uh, days of the week encoded such that Monday was a one in the a training set and was a zero in the validation set. We've got now two different sets where the same number has a different meaning. So we, we want to make sure that we... So let me give you an example. Um, let's say we were doing like full color images um, and our tests, uh, their training set can contained like green frogs, green snakes, and gray elephants. Right, we're trying to figure out which was which, and we normalized using you know the each each channel mean, and then we uh, have a validation set and a test set which are just green frogs and green snakes. So if we were to normalize by the validation sets um, statistics, we would end up saying things on average are green, and so we would like remove all the greenness out, and so we would now fail to recognize the green frogs and the green snakes effectively, right? So we actually want to use the same normalization coefficients that we were training on. And for those of you doing the deep learning class, we actually go further than that. When we use a pre-trained network, we have to use the same normalization coefficients that the original authors trained on. So the idea is that, you know, that the, a number needs to have this consistent meaning across every data set where you use it. Uh, can you pass it to us, Mito? Uh, that means when you're looking at the test set, you normalize the test set based on this this mean set. That's right. Okay. That's right. Okay. So um, here's a you know so so the valid validation uh, y values are just rank one tensor of ten thousand. Remember, there's this kind of weird Python thing where a tuple with just one thing in it needs a trailing comma. Okay, so this is a rank one tensor of length 10,000, and so here's an example of something from that. It's just the number three. Right. So that's our labels. So here's another thing you need to be able to do in your sleep: um, slicing into a tensor. So in this case, we're slicing into the first axis with zero. So that means we're grabbing the first slice. Um, so because this is a single number, this is going to reduce the rank of the tensor by one. 
it's going to turn it from a three-dimensional tensor into a two-dimensional tensor, right? So you can see here, this is now just a matrix, and then we're going to grab 10 through 14 inclusive rows, 10 through 14 inclusive columns, and here it is, right? So this is the kind of thing you need to be super comfortable, like grabbing pieces out, looking at the numbers, and looking at the picture. Right, so here's an example of a little piece of that first image. And so you kind of want to get used to this idea that if you're working with something like pictures or audio, you know, this is something your brain's really good at interpreting. Right? So like keep showing pictures of what you're doing whenever you can. Um, but also remember behind the scenes they're numbers. So like if something's going weird, print out a few of the actual numbers. You might find somehow some of them have become infinity or they're all zero, or whatever, right? So like, use this interactive environment um, and to explore the data as you go. Um, did you have a question? Uh, where's the box? Oh. Just a quick, I guess, uh, semantic question. Hmm. Why, when it's a tensor of rank 3, is it stored as like XYZ instead of like to me, it would make more sense to store it as like a list of like two D tensors. It's it's not stored as either, right? So but like um, for the formatting, because let's look at this as a three D. Okay, so here's a three D, right? So a three D tensor is formatted as showing a list of two D tensors, basically. But when when you're extracting it, why isn't it like if you're extracting the first one? Why isn't it X images? square bracket zero, close square brackets, and then a second set of square oh, brackets. Oh, because that has a different meaning, right? So um, it's kind of the difference between um, tensors and jagged arrays, right? So basically if you do like something like something like that, that says take the second list item and from it grab the third list item. And so we tend to use that when we have something called a jagged array which is where each subarray may be of a different length, right? Where else we have like a single object of three dimensions. And so we're trying to say like which little piece of it do we want? And so the idea is that that is a a single slice object to go in and grab that piece out. Uh, okay. Um, so here's an example of a few of those um, images, um, along with their labels. And um, this kind of stuff you want to be able to do pretty quickly with Matplotlib. Uh, it's it's going to help you a lot in in life in your exam. Um, so you can have a look at you know what Rachel wrote here when she wrote plots. Um, we can use um, we can use uh, add subplot to basically create those little separate plots. And um, you need to know that uh, I am show is how we basically take a NumPy array and draw it as a picture. Okay, and then we've also um, added the title on top. Uh, so there it is. All right. So um, let's now um, uh, take that data and try to build a um, neural network uh, with it. And so. A neural network, uh, and sorry, this is going to be a lot of review for those of you already doing deep learning. Um, a neural network is just a, a particular mathematical function or a class of mathematical functions, but it's a really important class because it has the property. Uh, it supports what's called the universal approximation theorem, which is that which means that a neural network can uh, approximate any other function arbitrarily closely. Right. So, in other words, it can do in theory, it can do anything. Uh, as long as we make it big enough. Um, so this is very different to a function like 3x plus 5, right, which can only do one thing. It's a very spe it's, a, it's a specific function. Or the class of functions ax plus b, which can only represent lines of different slopes moving it up and down different amounts. Or even the function ax squared plus bx plus c plus sine d, you know, again, only can represent a very specific subset of relationships. Uh, the neural network, however, is a function that can represent any other function to arbitrarily close accuracy. Right. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to learn how to take a function, and so let's take like ax plus b, and we're going to learn how to find its parameters, in this case a and b, which allow it to fit as closely as possible to a set of data. And so this here is showing an example uh, from uh, a notebook that we'll be looking at in the deep learning course, which basically shows what happens when we use something called stochastic gradient descent uh, to try and set a and b. And basically what happens is we're going to pick a random a to start with, a random b to start with, and then we're going to basically figure out do I need to increase or decrease a to make it closer, the line closer to the dots, do I need to increase or decrease b to make the line closer to the dots, and then just keep increasing and decreasing a and b lots and lots of times. Okay? So that's what we're going to do. And to answer the question, do I need to increase or decrease a and b, we're going to take the derivative. Right? So the derivative of the function with respect to a and b tells us how will that function change as we change a and b. Right? So that's basically what we're going to do. But we're not going to start with uh, just a line. Um, the idea is we're going to build up to actually having a neural net. And so it's going to be exactly the same idea, but because it's an infinitely flexible function, uh, we're going to be able to use this exact same technique to fit arbitrarily to arbitrarily complex relationships. Now, that's basically the idea. So then what you need to know is that a neural net is actually a very simple thing. Uh, a neural net actually is something which um, takes uh, as input, let's say we've got a vector, um, does a matrix product by that vector, right? So if this is like, this is of size, let's draw this properly. So like if this is size R, this is like R by C, a matrix product will spit out something of size C. Right, and then we do something called a nonlinearity, which is basically we're going to throw away all the negative values. So, can, so it's basically max zero comma x, and then we're going to put that through another matrix multiply, uh, and then we're going to put that through another max zero comma x, and we're going to put that through another matrix multiply, and so on. Right, until eventually we end up with uh, the single vector that we want. Um, so. Uh, in other words, each stage of our neural network is the key thing going on is a, a matrix multiply. So in other words, a, a linear function. So basically deep learning, most of the calculation is lots and lots of linear functions, um, but between each one we're going to replace the negative numbers with um, zeros. Can you uh, pass it to me? I'll pass it back. Yes. So why are we throwing away the negative numbers as we go through this we'll, process? We'll, we'll see. Okay. Right? The short answer is, if you apply a linear function to a linear function to a linear function, it's still just a linear function. Okay. Um, uh, so it's totally useless. But if you throw away the negatives, that's actually a non-linear transformation. And so it turns out that if you apply a linear function to the thing where you threw away the negatives, and apply that to a linear function, that creates a neural network, and it turns out that's a thing that can approximate any other function arbitrarily closely. So this tiny little difference uh, actually makes all the difference. And if you're interested in it, um, check out the deep learning video where we cover this, because I actually show um, a nice visual intuitive proof, um, not something that I created, but something that Michael Nielsen created, uh, or if you want to skip straight to his website. Uh, you could go to Michael Nielsen, uh, Universal, I think I spelled his name wrong, never mind, Hessian Theorem. There we go. Neural Networks and Deep Learning Chapter 4, and he's got a, a really nice um, walkthrough basically with lots of animations uh, where you can see why this works. Um, one. Th um, I feel like the, the, the hardest thing I feel like the hardest thing with um, getting started like technical writing on the internet is just like posting your first thing. Um, so um, if you do a search for Rachel Thomas medium blog, uh, you'll find this. We'll put it on the lesson wiki. Um, 
where she talks about uh, she actually says the top advice she would give to her younger self would be to start blogging sooner. Uh, and she has like um, both reasons why you should do it. Um, some examples of things that you know examples of places she's blogged and it's turned out to be great for her and her career, but then some tips about how to get started. Um, I, I remember when I first suggested to Rachel she might think about blogging because she had so much interesting to say, and you know at first she was kind of surprised at the idea that like she could blog, you know. And now people come up to us at conferences and they're like, oh, "You're Rachel Thomas, I love your writing," you know. So like I've kind of seen that that transition from like, "Wow, could I blog?" to to being known as a strong technical author. Uh, so yeah, so check out this. Um, uh, article uh, if you st still need convincing or if you're wondering how to get started. And since the first one is the hardest, maybe your first one should be like something really easy for you to write. You know, so it could be like, you know, here's a summary of the first 15 minutes of um, lesson three of our machine learning course. You know, here's why it's interesting, here's what we learned. Or it could be like, um, um, Here's a summary of how I used a random forest to solve a particular problem in my practicum. Um, I often get questions like, oh, my practicum, my organization, we've got like sensitive commercial data. That's fine. Like, you, you know, just find another data set and do it on that instead to show the example or, um, uh, you know, anonymize all of the values and change the names of the variables or whatever. Like, you can talk to your employer or your practicum partner to, to make sure that they're comfortable with whatever it is you're writing. Uh, in general though, you know, um, people love it when their interns and staff blog about what they're working on because it makes them look super cool, you know? It's like, hey, I'm an you know, uh, intern working at this company and I wrote this post about this cool analysis I did and then other people would be like, wow, that looks like a great company to work for. So generally speaking, you should find people are pretty supportive. Um, besides which, there's lots and lots of data sets out there available. Um, so even if you can't base it on the work you're doing, you can find something similar for sure. All right. So we're going to start building our neural network. We're going to build it um, uh, using something called PyTorch. Uh, PyTorch is a library that basically looks a lot like NumPy, um, but uh, when you create um, uh, some code with PyTorch, you can run it on the GPU rather than the CPU. Um, so the GPU um, is something which is basically going to be probably at least an order of magnitude, possibly hundreds of times faster than the code that you might write for the CPU um, for particularly stuff involving lots of linear algebra. Right? Uh, so with deep learning, neural nets, um, you can, if you if you don't have a GPU, you can do it on the CPU, right? But it's it's going to be frustratingly slow. Um, uh, your um, Mac uh, does not have a GPU that we can use uh, for this um, because uh, I'm actually advertising today. We need an NVIDIA GPU. Um, uh, I would actually much prefer that we could use your Macs because competition is great, right? But uh, NVIDIA were really the first ones to create a GPU which did a good job of supporting general purpose uh, graphics programming units, GP, GPU. So in other words, that means using a GPU for things other than playing computer games. Um, uh, they used, uh, they created a, a framework called CUDA, C-U-D-A. Um, it's, it's a very good framework. It's pretty much universally used in deep learning. Uh, if you don't have an NVIDIA GPU, you can't use it. No, no current Macs have an NVIDIA GPU. Um, most laptops of any kind don't have an NVIDIA GPU. If you're interested in doing deep learning on your laptop, the good news is that you need to buy one which is really good for playing computer games on. Uh, there's a place called Exotic PC Gaming Laptops where you can go and buy yourself a great laptop for doing deep learning. You can tell your parents that you need the money <laughs> to do deep learning. So could you please have... Yeah, so you'll generally find a whole bunch of laptops with names like Predator and Viper. Um, 
with pictures of robots and stuff. So, uh, Stealth Pro, Raider, Leopard. Anyway, um, having said that, like I don't know that many people that do much deep learning on their laptop. Most people will log into a cloud environment. Um, by far the easiest I know of to use is called Cressel. Um, with Cressel, uh, you can basically uh, sign up and straight away the first thing you get is a uh, thrown straight into a Jupyter notebook, uh, backed by a GPU, costs 60 cents an hour, uh, with all of the fast AI libraries and data already available. Um, so that makes life really easy. Um, it's less flexible and in some ways less fast than um, using AWS, um, which is the Amazon Web Services option. Um, it costs a little bit more, 90 cents an hour rather than 60 cents an hour, um, but it's very likely that your employer uh, is already using that. It's like it's good to get to know anyway. Um, they've got more different choices around GPUs uh, and it's a good, good choice. If you Google for GitHub Student Pack, if you're a student, you can get $150 of credits um, straight away, pretty much, um, and so that's a really good way to get started. Uh, Daniel, did you have a question? Yeah, can you pass that to me? Um, I just wanted to know your opinion on. I know that Intel recently published like an open source like way of like boosting like regular packages that they claim is equivalent like if you use the bottom tier GPU on your C like on your CPU if you use their boost packages like you can get the same performance do you know anything about that I yeah I do okay. it's a good question so um, and, and actually Intel makes some great um, numerical programming libraries particularly this one called MKL the matrix kernel uh, library um, they um, they definitely make things faster than not using those libraries. Um, but uh, if you look at a graph of performance uh, over time, uh, GPUs have consistently throughout the last 10 years, including now, um, are about 10 times more floating point operations per second than the equivalent CPU, um, and they're generally about a fifth of the price for that performance. Um, so yeah, uh, it, 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 and then because of that, like, Everybody doing anything with deep learning basically does it on NVIDIA GPUs and therefore using anything other than NVIDIA GPUs is currently very annoying. Uh, so slower, more expensive, more annoying. Uh, I really hope there will be more activity around AMD GPUs in particular uh, in this area, but AMD's got like literally years of catching up to do, um, so it might take a while. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to point out that um, you can also buy a thing such as like a GPU extender to a laptop. Yeah, that's also like kind of make, like maybe a first step solution before yeah. you really want to put something on. A, a yeah, AWS. yeah, I think for like three hundred bucks or so, yeah. you can buy something that plugs into your Thunderbolt port if you have a Mac, and then for another five or six hundred bucks, you can buy a GPU to plug into that. Having said that, for about a thousand bucks, you can actually create a pretty good, you know, GPU based desktop. Um, and so if you're considering that, uh, the fast AI forums uh, have like lots of threads where people help each other spec out something at a particular price point. Uh, anyway, so to start with, I'd say use Cressel, um, and then, um, you know, when you're ready to invest a few extra minutes uh, getting going, uh, use AWS. Um, to use AWS, uh, you basically... Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just talking to the folks online as well. So, <laughs> uh, okay. So, um, uh, so AWS. Um, when you get there, go to EC2. Uh, EC2, like, there's lots of stuff on AWS. Uh, EC2 is the bit where we get to like rent computers by the hour, right? Um, now we're going to need a GPU-based instance. Um, Unfortunately, when you first sign up for AWS, they don't give you access to them, um, so you have to request that access. So go to Limits up on the top left, right? And the main uh, GPU instance we'll be using is called the P2. So scroll down to P2, and here P2.xlarge, you need to make sure that that number's not zero, 
If you've just got a new account, it probably is zero, which means you won't be allowed to create one. So you have to go request limit increase. And the trick there is when it asks you why do you want the limit increase, type fast.ai because AWS knows to look out and they know that fast.ai people are good people. So they'll do it quite quickly. Um, that takes a day or two, generally speaking, to go through. Um, so once you get the email saying you've been approved for P2 instances, um, you can then go back here and say launch instance. And so we've basically set up one that has everything you need. So if you click on Community AMI, and AMI is an Amazon machine image, it's basically a, a completely set up uh, computer, right? And so if you type Fast AI, all one word, um, you'll find here Fast AI DL Part 1 Version 2 for the P2, right? So that's all set up, ready to go. So if you click uh, on um, Select, And then it'll say, okay, what kind of computer do you want, right? And so we have to say, all right, I want a GPU compute type, and specifically I want a P2 extra large, right? And then you can say review and launch. Um, I'm assuming you already know how to deal with SSH keys and all that kind of stuff. If you don't, uh, check out the um, introductory tutorials and workshop videos that we have online. Um, or Google around for SSH keys. Um, very important skill to know anyway. All right, so uh, hopefully uh, you get through all that, you have uh, something running on a GPU with the Fast AI repo. If you use Cressel, just uh, CD Fast AI 2, the, the repo is already there, uh, get pull. Um, AWS, Uh, CD fast AI the repo is already there get pull um, If it's your own computer, you'll just have to get clone um, and then away you go All right, so um, part of uh, all of those is PyTorch is pre-installed and so PyTorch basically means we can write code that looks a lot like NumPy um, But it's going to run really quickly on the GPU um, secondly um, since we need to know like which direction and how much to move our parameters to improve our loss, we need to know the derivative of functions. PyTorch has this amazing thing where any code you write using the PyTorch library, uh, it can automatically take the derivative of that for you. So we're not going to look at any calculus in this course, and I don't look at any calculus in any of my courses or in any of my work basically ever in terms of like actually calculating derivatives myself, because I've never had to. Uh, it's done for me by the library. So as long as you write the Python code, it's, the derivative is done. So the only calculus you really need to know to be an effective practitioner is like, what does it, what does it mean to be a derivative? Uh, and you also need to know the chain rule, which we'll come to. Um, all right, so we're going to start out kind of top-down, create a neural net, and we're going to assume a whole bunch of stuff, and gradually we're going to dig into each piece. right? So um, to create neural nets, we need to import the PyTorch neural net library. Um, PyTorch, funnily enough, is not called PyTorch, it's called Torch. Okay, so torch.nn is the PyTorch subsection that's responsible for neural nets. Okay, so we'll call that nn. And then we're going to import a few bits out of FastAI just to make life a bit easier for us. Um, so here is how you create a neural network in PyTorch. Uh, the simplest possible neural network. You say sequential, and sequential means I am now going to give you a list of the layers that I want in my neural network. Right? Uh, so in this case, my list has two things in it. The first thing says I want a linear layer. So a linear layer is something that's basically going to do y equals ax plus b. Right? Um, but um, uh, matrix matrix multiply, not not univariate, obviously. Um, so it's going to do a, a matrix product, basically. Um, so the input to the matrix product is going to be a vector of length 28 times 28, because that's how many pixels we have, and the output needs to be of size 10. We'll talk about why in a moment. But for now, you know, this is how we define a linear layer. Uh, and then again, we're going to dig into this in detail, but every linear layer just about in neural nets has to have a nonlinearity after it. And we're going to learn about this particular nonlinearity in a moment. It's called the softmax. And if you've done the DL course, you've already seen this. Um, so that's how we define a neural net. 
This is a two-layer neural net. There's also kind of an implicit additional first layer, which is the input. Um, but with PyTorch, you don't have to explicitly mention the input. But normally we think conceptually like the input image is kind of also a layer. Um, because we're kind of doing things pretty manually um, with PyTorch, we're not taking advantage of any of the convenience is in fast AI for building this stuff. We have to then write .cuda, which tells PyTorch to copy this neural network across to the GPU. Uh, so now, from now on, uh, that network is going to be actually running on the GPU. Uh, if we didn't say that, it would run on the CPU. Okay. Um, so that gives us back a neural net, a very simple neural net. So we're then going to try and fit the neural net to some data, so we need some data. Um, so uh, FastAI has this concept of a model data object, which is basically something that wraps up training data, validation data, and optionally test data. And so to create um, a uh, model data object, you can just say, I want to create some image classifier data, I'm going to grab it from some arrays, right? and you just say, okay, this is the path, then I'm going to save any temporary files, this is my training data, arrays, and this is my validation data, arrays. Okay, And so that just returns an object that's going to wrap that all up, uh, and so we're going to be able to fit to that data. So now that we have a neural net, and we have some data, we're going to come back to this in a moment, but we basically say what loss function do we want to use, what optimizer do we want to use, and then we say fit. We say fit this network to this data going over every image once using this loss function and this optimizer and print out these metrics. Bang! Okay, and this says here, this is 91.8% accurate. Okay, so that's like the simplest possible neural net. So what that's doing is um, it's creating um, a matrix multiplication uh, followed by a nonlinearity, and then it's trying to find the values for this matrix which cause, uh, which basically that fit the data as well as possible, that, are, that, that end up predicting this is a 1, this is a 9, this is a 3. And so we need some definition for as well as possible. And so the general term for that thing is called the loss function. So the loss function is the function that's going to be lower if this is better. right? Just like with random forests, we had this concept of information gain, and we got to like pick what function do you want to use to define information gain, and we were mainly looking at root mean squared error. Right? Um, most machine learning algorithms we call something very similar to that loss. Right? So the loss is how do we score how good we are. And so in the end we're going to calculate the derivative of the loss with respect to the, the weight matrix that we're multiplying by to figure out how to, how to update it. Right? So we're going to use something called negative log likelihood loss. So negative log likelihood loss is also known as cross entropy. Uh, they're literally the same thing. There's two versions, one called binary cross entropy or binary negative log likelihood, and another called categorical cross entropy. They're the same thing. Uh, one is for when you've only got a zero or one dependent. The other is if you've got like cat, dog airplane or horse, or 0, 1 through 9, and so forth. So what we've got here is the binary version of cross-entropy. And so here is the definition. Um, I think maybe the easiest way to understand this definition is to look at an example. So let's say we're trying to predict cat versus dog. 1 is cat, 0 is dog. So here we've got cat, dog, dog, cat. And here are our predictions. We said 90% sure it's a cat, 90% sure it's a dog, 80% sure it's a dog, 80% sure it's a cat. Right? So we can then calculate the binary cross entropy by calling our function. So it's going to say, okay, for the first one, we've got y equals 1, so it's going to be 1 times log of 0.9 plus 1 minus y, 1 minus 1, is 0, so that's going to be skipped. Okay? And then the second one is going to be a 0, 
So it's going to be 0 times something, so that's going to be skipped. And the second part will be 1 minus 0. Ah, so this is 1 times log of 1 minus p, 1 minus 0.1 is 0.9. So in other words, the first piece and the second piece of this are going to give exactly the same number. Which makes sense, because the first one we said we were 90% confident it was a cat, and it was. And the second we said we were 90% confident it was a dog, and it was. So in each case, the loss is coming from the fact that, you know, we could have been more confident. Yeah, so if we said we were 100% confident, the loss would have been zero. Okay? So let's look at that in Excel. Um, so here's our Point 0.9, point 0.1, point 0.2, point 0.8, right? And here's our predictions, 1, 0, 0, 1. So here's 1 minus the prediction, right? Here is log of our prediction. Here is log of 1 minus our prediction. And so then here is our sum, okay? So if you think about it, and I want you to think about this during the week, you could replace this with an if statement rather than y, because y is always 1 or 0, right? then it's only ever going to use either this or this. So you could replace this with an if statement. So I'd like you during the week to try to rewrite this with an if statement. okay? And then see if you can then um, scale it out to be a categorical cross-entropy. So categorical cross-entropy works this way. Let's say we were trying to predict 3, and then 6, and then 7, and then 2. So if we were trying to predict 3, and the actual thing that was predicted was like 4.7, right, uh, versus like, well actually think of it this way, we're trying to predict 3, and we actually predicted 5, or we're trying to predict 3, and we accidentally predicted 9, like being 5 instead of 3 is no better than being 9 instead of 3. So we're not actually going to say like how far away is the actual number, we're going to express it differently. Uh, or to put it another way, what if we're trying to predict cats, dogs, horses, and airplanes? You can't, like how far away is cat from horse? So we're going to express these a little bit differently. Rather than thinking of it as a 3, let's think of it as a vector with a 1 in the third location. And rather than thinking of it as a 6, Let's think of it as a vector of zeros with a one in the sixth location. So in other words, one hot encoding. Right? So let's one hot encode our dependent variable. And so that way now, rather than predicting, trying to predict a single number, let's predict ten numbers. Right? Let's predict what's the probability that it's a zero, what's the probability it's a one, what's the probability it's a two, and so forth. Right? And so let's say we're trying to predict the two, right? Then here is our binary cross entropy. Sorry, categorical cross entropy. So it's just saying, okay, did this one predict correctly or not? How far off was it? And so forth for each one, right? And so add them all up. So categorical cross entropy is identical to binary cross entropy. We just have to add it up across all of the categories. Right? Um, so try and turn the binary cross entropy function in Python into a categorical cross-entropy Python, and maybe create both the version with the if statement and the version with the sum and the product. Right? Um, all right, so that's why in our PyTorch we had 10 as the output as the output dimensionality for this matrix, because when we multiply by a, a matrix with 10 columns, we're going to end up with something of length 10, which is what we want. We want to have 10 predictions. Okay? So, so that's the loss function that we're using. All right, so then we can fit the model, um, and what it does is it goes through every image uh, this many times. So in this case, it's just looking at every image once and going to slightly update the uh, values in that weight matrix based on those gradients. And so once we've trained it, uh, we can then say predict, 
uh, using this model uh, on the validation set, right? And now that spits out something of 10,000 by 10. Uh, can somebody tell me why is this of shape, these predictions, why are they of shape 10,000 by 10? Go for it, Chris, it's right next to you. Um, well, it's because we have 10,000 uh, images um, we're, we're training on. 10,000 images training on, so that's what uh, well, we're validating on in we're this case, but ten, same thing. So 10,000 we're validating on, so that's the first axis. Yeah, that's the first axis. And then the second axis is because we actually make 10 predictions per image. Good, good, exactly. So each one of these rows is the probabilities that it's a naught, that it's a one, that it's a two, that's a three, and so forth. Okay, very good. So in math, there's a really common um, operation we do called argmax. And when I say it's common, it's funny, like, at high school I never saw argmax, um, first year undergrad I never saw argmax, but somehow after university everything's about argmax. Uh, so it's one of these things that's for some reason not really taught at school, but it actually turns out to be super critical. And so argmax is both something that you'll see in math, and it's just written out in full, argmax. Um, it's in NumPy, it's in PyTorch, it's super important. And what it does is it says, let's take this array of preds, right, and let's figure out on this axis, remember axis one is columns, right, so across, as Chris said, the 10 predictions for each one, for each row, let's find which prediction has the highest value and return, not that, if it just said max, it would return the value. argmax returns the index of the value, right? So by saying argmax axis equals one, it's going to return the index, which is actually the number itself, right? So let's grab the first five, okay, so for the first one it thinks is a three, then it thinks the next one's an eight, next one's a six, the next one's a nine, the next one's a six again, okay? So that's how we can convert our probabilities back into predictions. All right, so if we um, save that away, call it preds, we can then say, okay, when does preds equal the ground truth? Right? So that's going to return an array of bulls, uh, which we can treat as ones and zeros, and the mean of a bunch of ones and zeros is just the average, so that gives us the accuracy. So there's our 91.8%. And so you want to be able to like replicate the numbers you see, and here it is, there's our 91.8%. Right? So when we train this, it tells us, the last thing it tells us is whatever metric we asked for, and we asked for accuracy. Okay, so the last thing it tells us is our metric, which is accuracy, and then before that we get the training set loss, and the loss is again, whatever else we asked for, negative log likelihood, and the second thing is the validation set loss. Uh, PyTorch doesn't use the word loss, they use the word criterion, so you'll see here crit. Okay, so that's criterion equals loss. This is what loss function do we want to use, they call that the criterion. Same thing. Okay. Um, so here is how we can recreate that accuracy. So now we can go ahead and plot eight of the images along with their predictions, and we've got three, eight, six, nine, oh, wrong, five, wrong, okay. And you can see like why they're wrong, like this is pretty close to a nine, it's just missing a little cross at the top. Uh, this is pretty close to a 5, it's got a little bit of the extra here, right? So we've made a start, um, and, and all we've done so far is we haven't actually created a deep neural net, uh, we've actually got only one layer, uh, so what we've actually done is we've created a logistic regression. Okay, so a logistic regression is, is literally what we just built, and you could try and replicate this with sklearn's logistic regression um, package, uh, when I did it I got Similar accuracy, uh, but this version ran much faster, because this is running on the GPU, uh, where else sklearn runs on the CPU. Okay. So uh, even for something like logistic regression, we can you know, implement it very quickly with PyTorch. How uh, can you pass that to Ian? So when we're, when we're creating our net, we have to do dot CUDA. What would be the consequence of not doing that? Would it just not run? It wouldn't run quickly. Yeah. Uh, it'll run on the CPU. Can you pass it to Jade? 
So when we build the neural network, why is that we have to do、um, linear and follow by a nonlinear? Um. So the short answer is because that's what the universal approximation theorem says is the structure which can give you arbitrarily accurate functions for any functional form. You know. So the 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 long answer is the details of why the universal approximation theorem works.、Um, another version of the short answer is that's the definition of a neural network.、Uh, so the definition of a neural network is、um, a linear layer. Followed by a activation function, followed by a linear layer, followed by an activation function, etc.、Um, we go into a lot more detail of this in the deep learning course,、um, but you know, for for this purpose, it's it's enough to know like that it works.、Um, so far, of course, we haven't actually built a deep neural net at all. We've just built a logistic regression,、um, and so at this point, if you think about it, all we're doing is we're taking every input pixel. And multiplying it by a weight for each possible out outcome, right? So we're basically saying, you know, on average, the number one, you know, has these pixels turned on. The number two has these pixels turned on, and that's why it's not terribly accurate, right? That's that's not how digit recognition works in real life, but that's、uh, that's all we've built so far.、Uh, okay, can you pass that to Devon? So you keep saying this universal approximation theorem. Yeah. Did you define that?、Um, yeah,、um, but let's cover it again because it's worth talking about. So,、um, all right. So、um, Michael Nielsen has this、uh, great website called Neural Networks and Deep Learning, and his chapter four is is actually kind of famous now.、Uh, and in in it, he does this walkthrough of basically showing that.、Um, A neural network can、um, uh, can approximate any other function to arbitrarily close accuracy、uh, as long as it's big enough. And we walk through this in a lot of detail in the deep learning course.、Um, but the basic trick is that he shows that with um, um, a few different numbers, you can basically kind of cause these、um, things to kind of Create little boxes. You can move the boxes up and down. You can move them around. You can join them together to eventually, basically, create like connections of towers, which you can like use to approximate any kind of surface. Right.、Um, so that's you know that's basically the the trick.、Um, and so、uh, all we need to do, given given that, is to kind of find the parameters for each of the linear functions. Uh, in that neural network, so to find the weights in each of the in each of the matrices, and so so far、uh, we've got just one matrix, and so we've just built a simple logistic regression so far. Pinar, did you have a question?、No. Just a small doubt. I just want to confirm that、uh, when you showed images of the examples of the images which were misclassified, yeah, they look rectangular. So it's just that while rendering, the pixels are being scaled differently. So are they still twenty eight by twenty eight square? They are twenty eight by twenty eight. I think they're square. I think they just look rectangular because they've got titles on the top. I'm not sure. Yeah,、oh, good question. I don't know. Anyway, they are square. And、um, like Matplotlib, yeah, does often fiddle around with you know what it considers black versus white, and you know having different size axes and stuff. So yeah, you do have to be a bit careful there sometimes.、Um, okay, so. Hopefully this will now make more sense because what we're going to do is like dig in a layer deeper and define logistic regression without using nn dot sequential, without using nn dot linear, without using nn dot log softmax. So we're going to do nearly、um, all of the layer definition from scratch. Okay. So to do that,、um, we're going to have to define a PyTorch module. A PyTorch module is basically either a neural net or a layer in a neural net. Um, uh, which is actually kind of a powerful concept of itself. Basically, anything that can kind of behave like a neural net can itself be part of another neural net. And so this is like how we can construct particularly powerful architectures combining lots of other pieces.、Um, so to create a PyTorch module, just create a Python class,、um, but it has to inherit from nn dot module. So we haven't done inheritance before.、Um, Other than that, this is all the same concepts we've seen in OO 
already. Um, basically, if you put something in parentheses here, what it means is that our class gets all of the functionality of this class for free. It's called subclassing it. So we're going to get all of the capabilities of a neural network module that the PyTorch authors have provided, and then we're going to add additional functionality to it. When you create a subclass, there is one key thing you need to remember to do, which is when you initialize your class, you have to first of all initialize the superclass. Right? So the superclass is the nn.module. So the nn.module has to be built before you can start adding your pieces to it. And so this is just like something you can copy and paste into every one of your modules. You just say super.init. This just means construct the superclass first. Okay? So, um, having done that, we can now go ahead and define our weights and our bias. So our weights is the, the weight matrix. It's the actual matrix that we're going to multiply our data by. And as we discussed, it's going to have 28 times 28 rows and 10 columns. And that's because if we take an image which we flattened out into a 28 by 28 length vector, right? then we can multiply it by this weight matrix to get back out a length 10 vector, which we can then use to consider as a set of predictions. So that's our weight matrix. Now, the problem is that we don't just want y equals ax, we want y equals ax plus b. So the plus b in um, neural nets is called bias. And so as well as defining weights, we're also going to find bias. And so since this thing is going to spit out um, for every image something of length 10, that means that we need to create a vector of length 10 to be our biases. In other words, for everything 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 9, we're going to have a different plus b that we'd be adding. Right? So. We've got our data matrix here, which is of length 10,000 by 28 times 28. Right? And then we've got our weight matrix, which is 28 by 28 rows by 10. So if we multiply those together, we get something of size 10,000 by 10. Right? And then we want to add on our bias, oh, sorry, wrong way around, add on our bias, okay, like so. And so when we add on, and we're going to learn a lot more about this later, but when we add on a vector like this, it basically is going to get uh, added to every row. Okay, so the bias is going to get added to every row. So we first of all define those. And so to define them, we've created a tiny little function called get weights, which is over here, right? uh, which basically just creates some normally distributed random numbers. So torch.randn returns a tensor filled with random numbers from a normal distribution. We have to be a bit careful though. Um, when we do deep learning, like when we add more linear layers later, imagine if we have a matrix which on average tends to increase the size of the inputs we give to it. If we then multiply by lots of matrices of that size, it's going to make the numbers bigger and bigger and bigger, like exponentially bigger. Or what if it made them a bit smaller? it's going to make them smaller and smaller and smaller, exponentially smaller. So like, because a deep network applies lots of linear layers, if on average they result in things a bit bigger than they started with, or a bit smaller than they started with, it's going to like exponentially multiply that difference. So we need to make sure that the weight matrix is of an appropriate size that the inputs to it the kind of the mean of the inputs basically is not going to change. So it turns out 
that if you use um, normally distributed random numbers and divide it by the number of rows in the weight matrix, uh, it turns out that particular random initialization keeps your numbers at about the right scale, right? So this idea that like um, if you've done linear algebra, basically if the eigenvalue, the, the first eigenvalue is like bigger than one or smaller than one, it's going to cause the gradients to like get bigger and bigger or smaller and smaller. That's called gradient explosion, right? So we'll talk more about this in the deep learning course, but if you're interested, you can look up Kaiming her initialization uh, and uh, read all about um, this concept, right? But for now, you know, it's probably just enough to know that if you use this type of random number generation, you're going to get random numbers that are nicely behaved. You're going to start out with an input, which is mean zero, standard deviation one. Once you put it through this set of random numbers, you'll still have something that's about mean zero, standard deviation one. That's basically the goal. Okay. Um, one nice thing about PyTorch is that you can play with this stuff, right? So torch.randn, like try it out. Like every time you see a function being used, run it, right? And take a look. And so you'll see it looks a lot like NumPy, right? But it doesn't return a NumPy array, it returns a tensor. And in fact, now I'm GPU programming. Okay, like put .cuda and now it's doing it on the GPU. So like, I just multiplied that matrix by three very quickly on the GPU, right? So that's how we do GPU programming with PyTorch, right? Um, so this uh, this is our weight matrix. So we create, as I said, we create one 28 by 28 by 10. One is just uh, rank one of 10 for the biases. Um, we have to make them a parameter. This is basically telling PyTorch which things to update when it does SGD. Um, that's very minor uh, technical detail. So having created the weight matrices, um, we then define a special method with the name forward. This uh, is a special method. Um, the word, the name forward has a special meaning in PyTorch. Uh, a method called forward in PyTorch is the name of the method that will get called uh, when your layer is calculated. Okay, so if you create a, a, a neural net or a layer, you have to define forward, and it's going to get past the, the data from the previous layer. So our definition is to do a matrix multiplication of our input data times our weights and add on the biases. So that's it. That's what happened earlier on when we said nn.linear, it created this, this thing for us. Okay. Um, now unfortunately though, we're not getting a 28 by 28 long vector, we're getting a 28 row by 28 column matrix, so we have to flatten it. Uh, unfortunately in Torch, PyTorch, they tend to rename things. Uh, they they spell resize, uh, reshape. They spell it view. Okay, so view means reshape. So you can see here we end up with something where the number of images we're going to leave the same, and then we're going to replace row by column with a single axis. Again, negative one meaning as long as required. Okay, so this is how we flatten something using PyTorch. So we flatten it, do a matrix multiply. And then finally, we do a softmax. So softmax is the activation function we use. Um, if you look in the deep learning repo, you'll find something called entropy example, uh, where you'll see an example of softmax. Um, but a softmax simply takes the outputs from our final layer. So we get our um, outputs from our from our linear layer, and what we do is we go e to the power of. For each output, and then we take that number and we divide by the sum of the e to the power ofs. That's called softmax. Uh, why do we do that? Well, because we're dividing this by the sum, that means that the sum of those itself must add to one, right? And that's what we want. We want the probabilities of all the possible outcomes to add to one. Furthermore, because we're using e to the power of, that means we know that every one of these is between 0 and 1, and probabilities we know should be between 0 and 1. 
And then finally, because we're using a to the power of, it tends to mean that slightly bigger values in the input turn into much bigger values in the output. So you'll see, generally speaking, in my softmax there's going to be one big number and lots of small numbers. And that's what we want, right? Because we know that the output is one hot encoded. So in other words, a softmax activation function, the softmax nonlinearity, is something that returns things that behave like probabilities, and where one of those probabilities is more likely to be kind of high, and the other ones are more likely to be low. And we know that's what we want for a, a, to, to map to our one-hot encoding, so a softmax is a great activation function to use to kind of help the neural net, make it easier for the neural net uh, to, to map to the output that you wanted. And this is what we generally want. When we're kind of designing neural networks, we try to come up with little architectural tweaks that make it as easy for it as possible to, to, to match the output that we know we want. Um, so that's basically it, right? Like, rather than doing sequential, you know, and using nn.linear, nn.softmax, we have to find it from scratch. Uh, we can now say, just like before, our net is equal to that class .cuda, and we can say .fit, and we get to within a slight random deviation exactly the same output. Okay, so um, what I'd like you to do during the week is to play around with like torch.randn to generate some random tensors, torch.matmol to start multiplying them together, adding them up, try to make sure that you can rewrite softmax yourself from scratch, um, you know, like try to fiddle around a bit with, you know, reshaping view or that kind of stuff, so that by the time you come back next week, you feel like pretty comfortable with PyTorch. And if you Google for PyTorch tutorial, um, you'll see there's a lot of great material actually on the PyTorch website um, to, to, to help you along, basically showing you how to create tensors and modify them and do operations on them. All right, great. Uh, yes, you had a question? Can you pass it over? So I see that the forward is the layer that gets applied after each of the linear layers. So well, not I quite. Mean, the, the, the forward is just the definition of the module. So this is like how we're this is how we're implementing linear. So uh, does that mean after each linear layer we have to apply the same function? Let's say uh, we can't do a, a log softmax after layer one and then apply some other function after layer two if we have like a multi-layer neural network. So normally we define neural networks Normally we define neural networks like so. We just say here is a list of the layers we want. Right? We don't you don't have to write your own forward, right? All we did just now was to say like okay, instead of doing this, let's not use any of this at all, but write it all by hand ourselves. Right? So you can you can write as many layers as you like in what are, any order you like here. The point was that here we're not using any of that. We've written our own matmol plus bias, our own softmax. So this is like this is there's, there's, this is just Python code. You can write whatever Python code inside forward that you like uh, to define your own neural net. So like you, you won't normally do this yourself. Normally you'll just use the layers that PyTorch provides, and you'll use dot sequential to put them together. Or even more likely, you'll download a predefined architecture and, and use that. Um, we're just doing this to learn how it works behind the scenes. All right, great. Thanks everybody.